So welcome back from the coffee break. <laughs> so it's a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. She is Vicky Anderson from uh, Warwick, and uh, she gave like important contributions in uh, optimal investment and utility and difference pricing and incomplete markets. And today she will be talking about like uh, financial mathematics with prospect theory. Thanks. thanks, Luciano, and um, thanks to the, the LSE organizers um, and also the hosts, uh, Winter Capital, for the great facilities, and um, I'm looking forward to lunch. Um, so this is, <laughs> this is some joint work with um, some colleagues at Warwick. Alex, um, oops, wrong button already. Alex is a, um, was a PhD student at Warwick, and he moved um, last academic year to Cambridge to do a, a postdoc there for two or three years. Uh, so just to begin, um, so what I want to talk about today is in the broad field of behavioral economics. Um, this is a huge, uh, fairly mainstream area now, I would say, where economists look at work from psychologists um, and alter how they um, look at decision making under uncertainty according to research from psychologists who uncover lots of behavioral biases um, in the way we make these decisions. So it's basically um, the, the part we want to focus on really is, is a, a particular model called prospect theory, um, but there's a much bigger field out there um, beyond the particular <laughs> model that we want to think about. Um, so you've probably come across um, several popular literature books, ones by Kahneman himself, but there's, there's plenty more. Um, this is an old slide, I probably need to update this bit. Um, governments have behavioral insight teams and units to provide um, recommendations. Um, perhaps on election timing in the case of the UK, and I, I probably should cross out the US altogether because this was some group with Obama, and I, I doubt this group exists um, <laughs> any longer with Trump, or I can't imagine he's, um, he's, he's using this team. Um, or maybe he is, maybe he is, but anyway, things have probably changed there. So this is just to say that, that these, um, this, this field is, is pretty mainstream, um, Governments use it, banks and invest and hedge funds no doubt use it, um, and, and there's, there's a big field out there. Um, we're going to focus on prospect theory, which is probably one of the most well known and experimentally and empirically supported theory, um, which falls into a category of non expected utility theories. So we'll talk about the differences between prospect theory and a, a standard expected utility model. And this theory has been around for a long time. It goes back to the late 70s um, with a sort of update and tweaks um, quite a while later in 92. Um, and despite it being around for such a long time, um, as we'll see, there's still things to uncover when we want to use this in a, a dynamic, continuous time setting. So a lot of research in economics and psychology is in very simple static lottery situations. Um, but if we want to look at a sort of typical math finance, optimal stopping trading type model, then there's, there's still things to find out despite this, this theory being around for a long time. Okay, so... What um, ingredients come into prospect theory and why are they there? Um, so firstly, if we just think about some lotteries, what people found, well, way back in the 70s, is that we tend to be, whilst we tend to be, ris to be risk averse over gains, so we tend to prefer um, a certain 500 pounds, say, to a uh, 50-50 lottery between um, winning a thousand pounds and nothing. So we tend to go for the certain gain. If it comes to losses, if we turn things around and say, okay, now we're going to lose, you're going to pay me a thousand pounds or zero, um, or you can pay me for sure 500 pounds or $500, um, then you'll tend to prefer to gamble rather than to commit to paying $500. 
a certain amount. So we tend to be risk seeking where losses are concerned, but risk averse over gains. Um, and the, it's the risk averse over gains that, that, um, standard expected utility theory and, and standard, ex standard utility functions tend to assume you're risk averse everywhere. So this is, this is a big difference. Um, prospect theory also includes something called loss aversion, which is, is kind of a, um, well, again, it, it's putting more emphasis on losses. We'll see this mathematically when we write down some, some, um, functions, but it, it's thinking about, um, being averse to lotteries with small, um, positive expected gains. So people reject lotteries where you lose a hundred with probability of half and gain slightly more than a hundred with probability of half. People will say, no thanks, that's not, um, not enough, um, not enough of a gain here for me to want to enter this gamble. And then the main ingredient of prospect theory, well, the, 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 the one that differs most from standard expected utility is overweighting tail events. So this is now looking at small probabilities and it's trying to reconcile the fact that we like um, both to enter lotteries and to um, insure ourselves against um, events with small probability. So here we tend to prefer a very small chance, say one in a thousand of $500 or pounds to a certain $5 or pounds. So this is a lottery. We pay small amounts to enter a lottery. Um, but again, if we turn around to losses, we tend to prefer to, um, right, sorry, I think I've messed that. Oh, yeah, we tend to prefer to enter the lottery here if we're thinking about gains rather than a, a, a certain five pounds. Um, but we prefer to pay a certain loss, a small amount, say $5, five pounds, um, rather than risking a very small chance of losing a large amount. Okay, so the first one is a lottery and the second one is insurance and people tend to do both of these things. Um, so how do we reconcile that? And prospect theory reconciles that by saying that we overweight these events with small probability, overweight tail events. Okay, so what we want to do um, in this talk is think about optimal stopping models, um, so dynamic optimal stopping models um, with investors that have prospect theory preferences. And we want to show that including the probability weighting component of prospect theory can give us more realistic behavior than existing prospect theory models and existing expected utility models, um, which will be a special case, and help prospect theory match some features that we see in data. So this is um, a particular feature called the disposition effect, um, and we want to better match this effect, and in particular better match the, the size of this effect. So if I briefly introduce what the disposition effect is about, so this is um, the observation in many, many different markets that people prefer or have a higher propensity to sell winners relative to losers. So um, this goes back to the mid-80s, um, these Sheffrin and Statman have a paper about this, um, and the, the, the it, it sort of um, empirical work started with this paper of Odin in, in the late 90s. Um, and then people started investigating different data sets um, and, and running experiments in, 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 uh, on students in labs um, and, and looking at this. And then this paper of Sheffrin and Statman proposed that the disposition effect can be explained by prospect theory. Um, I'll come back later to talk about the intuition for this. But at this level, we're talking here about winners and losers, so gains and losses, and prospect theory is about treating gains and losses differently. So obviously there, there might be some link 
um, between the two. So if we look at some real data now, and so this is, this is essentially the data set of the Odin 98 paper. So it's a huge US um, retail brokerage data set with oh, a million trades or something like that. Um, and on the, all I want you to see on this graph is that there's a difference between um, the gains, which are on the right hand side above zero. So this is returns on the x axis. So we've got um, positive returns above zero and losses, negative returns um, on the left hand side. And the y axis is the proportion of days with sales giving that particular size of return. So the data is kind of bucketed into um, lots of small return buckets. And for any fixed bucket of returns, say around 0.2, um, we look at the um, all of the positions um, which would give you a return of, of 0.2 um, at any point in time in the data set from any trader in the data set over every stock in the data set. And, and these dots represent um, the proportion of the days where people actually sell relative to all the days where they could have achieved that level of return. So it's like a frequency picture. And all I want to show here is that the gains is much higher than the losses. Okay. And, and the Odeon data and many more papers, um, look at various ways of measuring this difference. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that, um, a bit later in the talk as well. Okay. So to define, give some of the definitions for, um, prospect theory. So we've got a, whoops keep pressing the wrong button. Right. We've got a function U, which is our, well, like our utility function. Um, so the difference to a, a standard utility function is it's going to be S shaped. And so it's going to reflect the fact that we're risk averse over gains and risk seeking over losses. So it's going to be concave on gains and convex on losses. So it will give us an S shape. It's going to be steeper for losses than for gains to capture the loss aversion feature I mentioned. So you could do this in sort of absolute terms um, as written here, or you could think about the relative slopes at zero and say um, it's steeper, the function's steeper on the loss side than on the gain side. Um, so that's, that's the features of the function u. Um, we've got to define gains and losses relative to some um, reference level. So um, I'm going to call the reference level r, um, but we'll just set this function as being 0 at 0. Um, and the weighting functions are, so firstly, there'll be, there'll be two weighting functions, a w plus and a w minus. And there'll be obviously zero at zero and one at one. Um, and they'll typically be concave, well, typically be inverse S shape. So they'll typically be concave up to some inflection point Q plus or Q minus. And they'll be convex after that point between the inflection point and one for some inflection point. Um, now that the shape of these things comes from, um, all the experimental work that Tversky and Kahneman and, and a host of other people have done. Um, and you really want them, you want them to be concave, um, initially to do the job of overweighting the small, um, tail events. Okay. So then we apply these weighting functions to the CDF to overweight the tails of the distribution. So we'll see this, um, in the, the upcoming slides. So just to, show some graphs. Um, so on the left hand side here, we've got the S shaped utility function, an example of the S shaped utility function. 
So this is the, the one used by um, Tversky and Kahneman, which is just a, a piecewise power function. So just glue two, two power functions together. This parameter, small k, is governing the, the, the slope. Um, this parameter will be bigger than one, and so it will give us a steeper slope to the um, left of zero um, to capture the loss aversion, and the alpha plus and alpha minus will capture the risk aversion and the risk seeking parameter um, on the gains and losses. Okay, so it will look something like this concave over gains and convex over losses, and a bit steeper here um, for the losses. And on the right hand side, we've got an example of weighting functions. Um, these are fairly horrendous, but these are the functions written down by Tversky and Kahneman. There are nicer looking functions in the literature, um, but it seems one needs to use their functions um, in your paper um, in addition to any other functions. So we'll, we'll use this as an example. Um, so the reason these aren't very nice is they're, they're, you've got to cut things off here at 0.28 because they're not monotonic, which is rather a rather unpleasant feature to have in your functions. But anyway, so we've got these weighting functions. We can play with the delta plus and the delta minus. Um, delta plus is the weight on gains. Delta minus is the weight on losses. And experimental findings have found numbers between 0.6 and 0.7. So if the delta is 1, then we're back to no probability weighting the 45 degree line. Um, and for 0 0.6, 0 0.7, we get lines looking like this, so the inverse S shape. And the critical thing is really this steepness here close to zero because this is the bit that's um, overweighting your um, tails of your distribution. Okay, let me get the right button for a change. Okay, so we put those ingredients together and we get the first line here. So what we want, um, so we have a continuous random variable y. Let's ignore the reference level on this slide. So now our prospect theory value, um, which I'm just denoting by this script e, with respect to the function u of the random variable y, can be written like this. So this is just separating y into y plus minus y minus, and that's where this minus sign's coming from here. And we're applying w plus, the weighting function for gains, to the um, CDF here for gains, and w minus is applied to the losses. Okay, so that's the basic um, definition for continuous random variables. If we didn't have the weighting functions, then this would indeed collapse just back to the expected utility of y. And there's another representation we can write down here involving the quantile function g. Um, so we get from this line to this line by changing variables and integrating by parts. Um, I just wanted to put this up because when we actually crank through the problem, we end up solving for the, well, I haven't even told you exactly what the problem is yet, but we end up, our, our solution is in terms of the quantile function g. So we can use either of these um, representations for the prospect theory value. Okay, so what exactly is the problem? So we want to write down, well, write down a very simple um, optimal stopping problem. Um, we've just got an investor with who wants to choose the best time to sell an asset in order to maximize the prospect theory value, as we defined on the previous slide, of the sale price of the asset P um, relative to the reference level R. 
So uh, another, well, I don't really want to get into this, but ref the reference level R is just some fixed constant. You can be more fancy with this reference level as well, but the typical case is, is just some fixed constant. And here, we really want to think about our reference level as being what we paid for the asset in the first place. It's really P0. Um, or if we had a bigger sort of buy-sell model, it, it, it's what we paid. Um, so we think about the, what we, what we, the price we sell for relative to some reference level, probably the price we paid for the asset. Um, now, this price, asset price P, um, for the sort of general results, it can just be some time homogeneous diffusion um, on um, zero infinity with some initial value P naught. Um, and then we'll look at special, well, one special example of this. Um, and again, if we take the weighting out of it, then, then um, the problem just with the S-shape utility um, and possibly some other tweaks in, in this model, um, these, these problems without the probability weighting have been um, well studied in the past. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is get the problem into a more manageable form. So the key thing, key step here is to rescale the price process P to be a martingale. So we want to use the scale function and just transform P into a new price process X so that we've got a martingale to work with. Um, and we also want to get rid of the reference level so we don't have to keep worrying about this. So we'll just scale this away. The, uh, obviously, yeah. Right. So um, now we've got our price process X is, is a martingale and it's transformed gains and losses relative to a reference level. So our original problem here on the left hand side can be rewritten as a simpler problem with the price process X as long as we redefine a new function little v, which is just our old utility. Um, this is our rescaling from P to X and our rescaling of the reference level. So later I'm going to make some assumptions on this little v and all we need to remember is v is now a function of two things, the original utility u and the scale function of the price process. So it depends on um, the utility we chose and the price process we chose and that determines the shape of this little v. Okay, if we now also rescale the state space, so zero infinity becomes LM, a key step is we don't want, we want to take this um, lower limit to be finite. Okay, so we take that to be finite, and if we do this, then we can take the um, stopped process, the stopped martingale X, as our decision variable rather than the stopping time. So our new problem can become um, maximized over the distribution or law of the stopped process X tor over some admissible set that I'll explain of the prospect theory value of X. Okay, so the key things are work with the martingale and have a, a lower bound on your state space and this means that um, X is bounded below, our martingale here is bounded, well, local martingale is bounded below. Um, so this means X is a super martingale. So that property gives us an inequality here because this is just the expected value of X tor. So that would give us, the super martingale property gives us expected value of X tor is less than or equal to X naught here. Because of the problem U is increasing, more, more wealth is always good, even in prospect theory. Um, so U is increasing, so we never want to take less than we can here. So we take equality here um, because we never want to do worse than that because of the problem. Um, so that gives us equality here. So this gives us like a mean constraint. And Skorohod embedding says that for every law new, 
um, with this mean constraint, there is a stopping rule to such that we achieve the correct law new. Okay, so if we put those things together, we can, we've transformed the problem into choosing a distribution for this stopped um, process XTOR subject to um, this, this mean constraint. Okay, so if we uh, step back, I thought we were going to the next slide with the, towards the solution, but if we step back, so, um, some of, so this, that particular idea, that particular step, um, was used in, in a previous work, um, of, um, Xu and Xu, um, who look at problems for gains or losses separately, um, and their solution for losses is, um, um, how shall I say it? Um, uh, we make progress on the, the, the losses side in particular. So we'll put the gains and losses problem together and we'll give some additional conditions relative to some of their work under which we'll get a single point mass on losses to be optimal. Okay. And I think in, in, in their previous work on losses, they get, um, they don't pin it down to a single point mass. So we'll identify some conditions that enable us to do that, which obviously enables us to make more progress on the applications. Um, the other feature that I want to mention and then forget about is the fact we've introduced this probability weighting introduces timing consistency. Okay. Um, I never really saw this mentioned before 2012, which is kind of staggering, but there you go. Maybe people didn't really think about it. But um, in these problems, um, what we're doing here is we're thinking about a, a time zero problem, um, an opt a time zero optimal stopping problem. So the investor's sophisticated, and we're just going to look at the time zero problem. So we're effectively saying, um, you're going to pre-commit to the outcome of, of this time zero problem. Now, if we don't do that, all sorts of things can happen. These are, it's really interesting, but we can't really make much progress because there's a really neat paper by, um, some mathematical economics guys, um, Ebert and Strack, and they show that as soon as we look at naive agents in a prospect theory stopping model, they basically never stop. Okay. They just, um, they won't sell. And so that uh, if I get time, which I'm not going to get time, then I, I'll come back and talk about that. But yeah. So, but this, this is really neat. Um, and we've done a, a different piece of work, um, which follows on from their work, which says, um, if we expand the set of strategies you can use, then the naive agents can stop. Um, if you follow, um, if you expand the set of strategies to allow for randomized strategies. Okay. So, um, so this is, this is a different strand of this problem. Um, and, and it's an important strand, but today we're just going to fix on this time zero problem and see where that takes us and then caveat everything by saying we're assuming, um, this is for pre-committing investors. And if you buy that, some people can commit to this strategy, then this is what happens. Um, okay. So the extra assumptions we need, I still haven't got to the slide I was expecting, but the extra assumptions we need, um, are one assumption on V itself. So remember I said V is just this rescale utility function and it depends on the U and it depends on the scale process. So we need this to have a particular shape. So we need this to be concave, uh, hang on, concave on 0M and convex on L0, okay? And we need, I'll, I'll, I'll explain where this comes into things when I get to the right point. So we need the slope at 0 to the right of 0 to be infinite. 
Okay, so this is one assumption. Um, and the other assumption is something we're calling elasticity. I think we've relabeled this as self-elasticity in the latest version. So this is um, a property that happily popped out of the algebra here, which got pretty messy. Um, but elasticity is just um, a measure of two, well, two measures of the slope of a function um, and relative to some fixed point C. Okay, so we've just got the, the derivative at the point X, so the tangent here compared to the slope of the line between the point X and the fixed point C. And we want to worry about how these two, how the ratio of these slopes varies with um, X. Okay, so the two assumptions that we need are, firstly, we need one of, we need an elasticity assumption on the little fun value function V. Okay and relative to the point L, so the lower end of the state space, we need that to be increasing in X. And we need another elasticity condition on the weighting function for losses. And we need that uh, relative to any R in naught one, and we need that to be decreasing in P. So to be honest, I don't have a lot of intuition for exactly, I mean, they, we were happy to be able to manipulate things into some ratio of derivatives. Um, and I don't have a lot of intuition for these. However, the good news is, firstly, they're easy to verify because we've got two separate conditions, one on V and one on W minus. We don't have some horrible joint condition on, on all the functions at once, which would be impossible. Um, so they're, they're easy to verify. And the second one is, true in all the popular weighting functions in the literature. I mean, all the, all the main ones we could find, you can easily verify this condition. So we're not, we're not requiring anything very onerous, thankfully, um, on the weighting functions. And this condition and this condition will be satisfied in, in the main model that we have in mind um, as well. So if we have those conditions, then we can decompose the problem, solve for gains first and then losses and put them together subject to the mean constraints. The only thing I want to point out on this slide is um, for the losses problem, we end up with a three point distribution. Okay, and we, so this is sort of where the Zhu and Zhou work ended. They, they had this sort of three point distribution and we have weight on the lower limit, zero and some interior point I. Okay, so there's three points where you, where you potentially put, um, mass. So what we can then do with the assumptions on the previous slide, the, whoops, the elasticity assumption and the assumptions on V, we can rule out one of I or L and get it down to the point zero or, well, sorry, zero and either put weight on L or put weight on I. Um, and then the assumption on the slope of the function V to the right of zero, this being infinite, means you'd never want to stop at zero. Okay, so you, you rule out putting weight on zero and you get down to a single threshold either at the lower limit, which effectively means there isn't a, a threshold, or at some interior point. Okay, and we can look at when you get one and the other of these in a particular model. Okay, so this, okay, so the main result before we've put any more, um, ingredients, specific ingredients into the model beyond the assumptions we've talked about, um, at that level of generality, we can show that we get a single mass on losses. So that mass can be on L or I, so it can be an interior point, which is the interesting case, or it can be 
at the end point of the um, state space. And then on gains, we put mass at some gains level A together with continuous distribution um, from A upwards. Okay, so we don't have a simple threshold structure anymore on gains as we do on losses. Okay, um, I don't want to talk about this. I'm simply, this is simply to say we can write this thing down. This is how the optimal solution looks. And this is, this is the quantile function, remember. Okay, so we can write this down. I'm not sure I've even defined all those parameters, but it, it, it can be written down in half a slide. Um, and, and dealt with. Okay, so if we now plug in a particular model, so let's take a geometric Brownian motion for our price process with a rather strange choice of drift row, um, then we simply have to check that all our assumptions are satisfied um, in order to apply that theorem. Okay, so this slide just worries about everything being satisfied. So for example, okay, and let's also take the, the kahneman tversky value and weighting functions, okay? So a concrete example with their functions and geometric Brownian motion, which is probably the base case that we really want to look at. Um, so our V will be S-shaped provided beta is less than or equal to one, so this is just the fact that our expected return row is non-negative, okay, which is reasonable. And this assumption that this is essentially that um, our expected return is not too big relative to our risk aversion. Because if our expected return is big, um, too big relative to our risk aversion. If we're not very risk averse and we've got the prospect of big returns, then again, we just won't sell. We'll just wait forever. Okay. So these kinds of conditions turn up in, in all of, in all of these models. Um, in this setting, we have a slightly stronger condition that brings in the probability weighting on gains delta plus. So, so without the delta plus, we just have the comparison between risk aversion and expected returns. Um, putting the delta plus in is just saying that we can't have the probability weighting on gains to be too strong. If we have massive probability weighting on gains, um, then again, we just wait and do nothing. We don't sell because we always, we always think we can get this massive um, payoff. Okay, so it's just incorporating that fact um, into things. So these are both on the gain side. Notice we, we care if we're trying to rule out the degenerate cases where we basically just don't stop, don't sell. Then we care. We have to rule out things to do with how risk averse we are. We can't be too risk averse. How much probability weighting there is. There can't be too much probability weighting on gains um, relative to the expected return of the asset. Okay, so we can write that down and select um, num select parameters that respect that condition. Um, the assumptions that we need are all satisfied by this selection um, of model, and our L is indeed finite, so everything puts us into the um, framework of the theorem. And so we know we're going to get a stop loss threshold and a distribution over gains. So this is just an example of the quantile function with some numbers plugged in. So we've got, don't know how well you can see this at the back, we've got zero ones, so we've got probabilities on the x axis, and we've got, um, have we rescaled? Okay, I think we've taken the scaling away again and we're in P terms. So we've got a reference level R of one. A one is here on our Y axis. Um, and so it's, so the, the picture has 
is, is representing the loss threshold is down here. So it's significantly below one. It's around 0.7 ish. Okay. And we put weight, we put weight of around 0.42 or so on that, um, threshold of around 0.7. And the thing to notice is then the gains, the starting point um, of the gains distribution is closer to one, so maybe around 1.15 or so, and then we have this long right tail um, for the distribution we want to achieve over gains. So this is the unique distribution under these um, assumptions of the model that we want to achieve um, uh, under this prospect theory model. Um, I should point out we've taken Weighting, probability weighting parameters of 0.7 to be around the, the numbers that people want in the literature. Um, our loss aversion is probably lower than, than people tend to want. Um, uh, and, okay, um, we've got an alpha plus of a half and an alpha minus of 0.9. Um, so we've got much strong, we're, we're much more risk averse than we are risk seeking. Um, yeah, I think, oh, no. Okay, if we have that, this, this, this needs to be, not too high, we need to have um, enough risk aversion here um, in order to, to sell at all. Remember, going back to those conditions. Okay, so we can't have um, a high, we can't have weak risk aversion, so we can't have the alpha plus up to 0 0.8, 0 0.9, or you just won't sell. Um, so that's, that's why we've got reasonably strong risk aversion there. Okay, so we can also look at um, the impact of varying the probability weighting because that's what we're mostly interested in um, in this work. So on the x-axis, we've got the delta parameter, so the, the probability weighting parameter. We've just set the two things on gains and losses to be equal, and it's varying on the graph between 0.65 and 1. So if we think about probability, the weighting parameter being one, then things collapse back to a threshold model. Okay, now for these parameters, the lower threshold when there's no probability weighting and indeed for a certain range of probability weighting down to about 0.75, this lower threshold is at zero. So that's the L, the, the lower um, end of our state space in the model. Okay. So effectively, there is no lower threshold, um, for value, for, um, weak, weak probability weighting. Okay. Or no probability weighting. And once we get below about 0.75, we get strong enough probability weighting. Then the threshold switches from L to the interior threshold. The Doubted the dashed vertical line here is a cut through of 0.7. So that's um, corresponding to the previous slide. The, the picture on the previous slide was the quantile function for that particular value. So this is really just to show you that you might not get, you might get a, a loss threshold at, at zero. You will get an interior loss threshold if the probability weighting is strong enough. If I extended the graph and the probability weighting on gains gets too strong, then you just won't sell at all. So I can't extend the graph. Um, and the other thing to point out is the loss threshold is, is relatively far away from one. Now, I haven't even explained what these two lines are supposed to be. Um, this is a representation of the distribution over gains. So what I've got here is the lower level, um, the A, the little A from the theorem. So but the, the lowest point where you put mass is, is this black line here. And 
the curved line here is the 99th percentile of that distribution. Okay, just to have something to represent here. So, um, so this cut through is, is what we saw on the previous slide. And again, at, we, don't, we see the lower bound doesn't change that much because it's so close to the reference level. Um, and it, it's, it, it's pretty insensitive to the probability weighting. But what we see is we go from a threshold here with no probability weighting. Um, Right, and as we increase the strength of probability weighting, the um, the range of values that we put weight on for our distribution um, balloons up here. So we get um, a big right tail, basically, for the gains distribution. Okay, so. I think I've probably said everything on this slide. So this is just going through those cases of no weighting. Um, there's been a bunch of papers without weighting, um, which recover one-sided or two-sided threshold strategies. Typically, these gain thresholds, as we've seen um, on the previous slide, are pretty close to the reference level. And the loss threshold is much further away. Okay, and this is just because the marginal utility is decreasing in size, so you want small gains and large losses without probability weighting. Okay, so your gain threshold is, is close to the reference level and you make occasional large losses. Okay, now what this means for a return distribution without probability weighting is it tends to be negatively skewed because you've basically got lots and lots and lots of small gains and occasional big losses. Okay. Um, if uh, right, so I'll, I'll jump ahead a bit and say um, this means if we don't have probability weighting in the model, and we get this kind of strategy out, this sort of double-sided threshold, um, we will get. Uh, we will get the disposition effect in the sense that we'll be making many more gains. We'll be making lots and lots of small gains and occasional losses. So if you just think in terms of gains and losses, we'll definitely be, be realizing lots of gains and we won't be realizing so many losses. Um, but typically, this turns out to be very extreme, meaning that the, the we make massive, massive numbers of small gains and hardly any losses. And so the disposition, the magnitude of this thing will be much too big. It, it won't be close to what we really see in reality. Um, so it won't really be good enough, um, despite the fact I worked on this and claimed it was um, an improvement. It, 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 won't be, it won't be very realistic. It will be too extreme. Okay, and when we put the weighting in, then we see this long right tail. This is exactly what we expect. Um, it makes perfect sense because the probability weighting is overweighting those extreme gains. And so you want to put probability mass there in order to have a chance of, of getting those gains because they're overweighted. Um, and... When the probability weighting is sufficiently strong but not violating any of the um, assumptions, there's a non-zero stop-loss threshold. And the good thing about this distribution now is it tends to be right or positively skewed because of this long right tail. Okay, So without the probability weighting, we tend to get left skewness or, or negative skewness. With the probability weighting in there, we tend to get right or positively skewed um, return distributions, and this better fits with um, what we see in um, well, what what people um, seem to be aiming for in 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 um, in reality. Okay, so, okay, so to talk a bit more about that. So this difference with gains and losses, 
is, is much more realistic than just a, a double-sided threshold strategy because typically people do use stop-loss strategies um, an awful lot and they're not easily that easily justified um, in theoretical models. And um, people don't tend to, well, at least it's my understanding that people don't tend to use um, stop-gain strategies nearly as much as they use stop-loss strategies. So to have a difference between the two in the out outcome of the model is, is a good thing. Um, and typically expected utility strategies tend to put lower thresholds at, at well, zero or minus infinity, um, and they tend to put exactly stop-gain thresholds, um, which I'm arguing are, are much, less used, much less common in practice. Um, if, if models do have a stop-loss in there, they tend to be a double-sided model with a stop-gain strategy as well. Okay, so it's quite hard to get this totally different strategy um, over gains and losses because even the prospect theory models with the S-shape function in there still give you a, a double-sided threshold strategy. Um, and there's also experimental evidence, if you don't believe my sort of heuristics here, um, experimental evidence that people in lab experiments don't play um, cutoff or threshold strategies over gains. Um, from from another another paper of um, Philip Strack, so so I'm arguing that this better fits um, what we see, and I'll also argue it better fits the disposition effect um, in the last few minutes. So we talked about the disposition effect being about the frequency that we sell winners or losers relative to the opportunities to sell them, and that we people realize a larger fraction of winners than they do losers. So going back to this Odeon paper, um, he just calculates this frequency um, uh, number in, in the data. So he comes up with a proportion of gains realized, so the number of times a gains realized as a fraction of the total number of times a gain could have been realized, and he does the same for losses and he finds these numbers about 15% versus about 10%. Um, so he says, okay, that means, that means we're realizing in his data set, um, gains are realized at roughly a 50% higher rate than losses. So it's like going back to that picture I showed you of the data at the very beginning, and he's basically... Um, coming up with two numbers, so he's kind of averaging over the two sides of this picture. So you're losing, you're losing information by just obviously coming up with these two summary statistics, um, some average proportion over gains and some average proportion over losses. Um, but that's like the simplest thing you, you would come up with doing. Um, and, and that's what he observes. So if we, Okay, if we step back and say, well, why should these models, why should prospect theory help us explain this? If we go right back to this 85 paper, then okay, the, the basic intuition is that because we're risk averse over gains, that's encouraging us to stop in prospect theory and we're risk seeking on losses and that's encouraging us to gamble. Okay, and that's kind of the, the static intuition that you could hand wave um, from the S-shaped utility function. Now, if we just take the S-shaped utility function, as I've said before, we do get a disposition effect. We do get this big difference between gains and losses realized, but it tends to be much too extreme or even infinite if the lower sale threshold is at the lower limit of zero. Okay, so, so we do get this, but it's, it's much too big. The numbers are huge. Um, it's not a ratio of 1.5. It's more like a ratio of 100 or 200 or something. So it, it's much too big. Um, people have tried to tweak this in various ways to get, to stick with just the S-shaped utility function, but 
improve the, the numbers for this disposition effect. So you can have a kind of reinvestment model, which is a good thing, um, but they kind of play a bit with the preferences, which I don't really like to do um, because it feels like too much of a tweak or um, you do mixtures with Poisson traders or whatever. So it's people have worked hard on this um, without probability weighting and, and not really um, not really got much further along. Um, and then the intuition from the probability weighting is exactly what we want because it's it's working against the disposition effect. So we're roughly saying if we overweight the extreme gains, that makes us wait longer. We like this right tail. And if we overweight the extreme losses, we don't want those losses. So that's encouraging us to stop. So this is exactly the opposite of the, the effect coming from the S-shaped utility. So hopefully combining these can bring us closer to these numbers. Um, okay, so we first have to come up with a measure to proxy this statistic of Odeon's because he's just adding up these, um, adding up the, the um, frequencies of gains and losses, um, sorry, when people realize the gains and losses in the data, um, so it's a discrete thing. Um, so we have to write down something in our model that, that approximates that. So we just look at um, the ratio for the uh, proportion of realized gains. We look at the probability that we're um, making a gain when we stop relative to the expected amount of time that the process spent in gains. Okay, so that's the, the um, getting this frequency idea in there and we do the same for losses and then we say the disposition is the ratio of, of these two ratios, RG and RL, just like Odeon did and we can write this down um, in a simple way, and then the disposition effect occurs if this D measure is bigger than one. Okay, now in the model, we can now play with this um, definition and write down a ugly but workable formula for this quantity, okay, and this is true this, this expression is true for, um, we're going back to our general martingale um, X, so our general um, time homogeneous martingale, um, and then our, the disposition measure depends just on this optimal prospect, this optimal distribution, but not the stopping rule um, to generate that prospect. So that's a good thing because it's the optimal distribution, the prospect that's the unique thing. And so we can write down an expression for this and use this to generate some graphs. So just to finish up, um, we've got one graph here where we vary the probability weighting parameter. We set them equal for gains and losses for this graph and we look at how the log of D varies against the probability weighting. So as I pointed out, as the probability weighting gets weaker, we head towards one. This is down to 0.65 and up to 0.74. So if we're up here somewhere, the log of D is going to be um, just growing and this disposition number um, without probability weighting is, is, is much too big. Okay. Um, but when we have reasonable levels of probability weighting between 0.65 and 0.74, then we get this blue line here and the Odeon number of 1.51. The log of that corresponds to 0.18 and that's the red dashed line here. So, I mean, it doesn't, well, where there's other parameters that have been put in here, of course. Um, so it doesn't matter what precisely this number is, but it just shows we can at least get ballpark um, disposition numbers for reasonable parameters um, in this model 
and it, it's because purely because of this probability weighting feature that's brought the um, brought this ratio back down to reasonable numbers. Okay, I'll skip that and just conclude. Um, so what we were trying to do is better characterize the optimal solution for this prospect theory investor. So remember, it's this pre-committing time zero problem. We're not addressing the time inconsistency issues here. We're just saying if we can pre-commit, what optimal strategy would we follow? Or what optimal distribution would we aim for? And we can show if we introduce some mild conditions that are solve, uh, hold in the models that we're, we're worried about, um, that we get this stop loss threshold and we get a distribution over gains. And this better fits with what we see, um, in reality. And we want to use this and, and we do use this to look at realistic levels of the disposition effect, um, which improve upon um, existing work on that problem. And I'm definitely out of time, um, which is not a good thing to do at lunchtime. So I apologize for that. Um, but there's probably time for one question and then you can catch me um, over lunch. Okay, thanks. You'll find for uh, one or two questions from the audience. Questions or comments? <laughs> Actually, I have just one short question. I'm curious because you, if you, what happens if you remove this pre-commitment assumption? Ah, well then, then, okay. So if you think, oh, yeah, I never had time to talk about it. Um, <laughs> Well, it's a whole nother talk, basically. So, um, well, if you, if you, um, you mean like anything can happen, or uh, you can still okay. have some structure. You have to put more. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, if you just leave yourself in this exact problem, so there's just the optimal stopping with the same ingredients. Um, let me think. Yes. Then. then you can <sighs> yeah if you don't put any extra things into the model then um, this paper of Ebert and Strack show that you can basically construct you, you construct um, at every point you construct this um, two-sided threshold strategy, which your process, um, what well, you stop when you exit this, this interval, um, but you construct this interval in a way, um, in such a way that you, it's, it's, um, it's skewed. So you've got a small chance of a big gain and a small uh, a big chance of lots of small of a small loss basically and um, you you can then just keep constructing this this because you're in a continuous time setting with this process you when you hit this this exit this interval you just construct the next interval and so you basically just keep going um, so you have to put you have to do something more um, in this in this model to take that feature away, um, which is what we looked at in a different paper, but it's really a whole nother talk. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.